Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Vogel, and I am the incoming co-vice president of CIC Vancouver. Thank you for joining us for this evening's event, The New Age of Sino-Canadian Relations, What's Next? At a time when Canada's relationship with China seems to be at a pivotal point, we are fortunate to be joined by some of the country's brightest minds on the matter. It is my pleasure to welcome our panelists for tonight. Paul Evans, Lynette Ong, Gordon Halden, Jim Boutoulier, as well as our moderator, Susan Gregson. Paul Evans is calling in from Vancouver on the traditional unceded land of the Musqueam and Coast Salish peoples. Gordon Halden is calling in from Penticton on the traditional and unceded land of the Silks Okanagan people. The University of Alberta is also located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Jim Batumia is calling in from Victoria on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples. Lynette Ong is calling in from Toronto, which is located on Treaty 13 territory and on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I should mention that I am also myself calling in um, from Toronto. Susan Gregson, our moderator for this evening's panel, is calling in from Ottawa on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. Susan Gregson is a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa and has served the Canadian public service with distinction for 35 years. Between 2013 and 2016, she was Assistant Deputy Minister for Asia Pacific Relations at, for the Asia Pacific Region at Global Affairs Canada. Prior to her last assignment, she served in various roles at the then Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, including as Assistant Deputy Minister for Human Resources, Director General of Assignments and Executive Management, Director General Regional Strategies, World Market Branch, and Director Human Rights, Humanitarian Affairs, and International Women's Equality Division. She has also represented Canada abroad, most notably as Deputy High Commissioner to London, Consul General of Canada in Shanghai, Minister Counselor of the Canadian Embassy in Beijing. She holds a BA in Anthropology from the University of British Columbia and was a China-Canada Scholar at Nankai University and Fudan University. Thank you very much, Susan Gregson, for moderating our panel tonight. I'm now going to hand things over to you to get started with our discussion. Thanks so much, Ben. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and uh, join these uh, distinguished panelists. So I've been a uh, keen observer of China since about 1976. I'm dating myself here. And uh, I was in, uh, in China as a student from 78 to 80. Um, and I have to say that the Canada-China relationship is probably at the lowest point that uh, I can remember following the, the detention of Meng Wanzhou. It's been one year and 280 days since Michael Kovrig has been detained. And of course, Michael Spavor was uh, detained around the same time in an egregious display of hostage diplomacy. Canada has also been subject to various trade related sanctions. So Canadians have been increasingly aware of China's surveillance and pressure of Chinese and Canadian citizens in Canada. And uh, China's new assertive posture on the international scene has uh, many observers very concerned. Canadians are concerned also about uh, China's human rights record, as well as developments in Hong Kong. But we know that China is not going away. And on the contrary, is looking and acting very much like a superpower. Uh, China's our second lar largest trading partner. People to people ties are strong and very important. So our discussion today is very timely. Our topic is the new age of Sino-Canadian relations, what next? And we're asking our panelists to drill down to three top priorities for a restart uh, in Canada's approach to China. So I think we're in for a, a very interesting evening. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Paul Evans, I'm sure is very well known to many of you. Uh, Paul has been a professor at the University of British Columbia since 1999, teaching Asian and Trans-Pacific International Relations. His work was based at the Institute of Asian Research and the uh, Leo Institute for Global Issues, which are now both located in the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. He is currently a Canadian representative on the ASEAN Regional Forum's Experts and Eminent Persons Group. Gordon Holden is an esteemed former colleague and uh, from Foreign Affairs, and in fact, we served together at the embassy in Beijing in the early 80s. Gordon uh, served as a diplomat in many senior positions in Ottawa, China, and Taiwan, and is now the director of the China Institute, professor of Chin Science and adjunct professor of the, Univers of the Alberta uh, School of Business at the University of Alberta. He's also an adjunct professor at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. 
Lynette Ong will also be familiar uh, uh, to many of you as a fre frequent commentator on China and on Asia more broadly. She's Associate Professor of Political Science at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, University of Toronto. She's an expert of China and Southeast Asia, particularly Singapore and Malaysia. Jim Boutillier is the former Special Advisor Policy at Canada's Maritime Forces Pacific Headquarters in Esquimalt, British Columbia. He was responsible for advising the Commander of Maritime Forces Pacific on matters of defense. He spent 24 years at the Royal Roads College, um, military college, college, where he taught courses on naval history, contemporary Asia, the history of the Pacific, and strategic issues. So I would like to first turn the floor uh, to Paul Evans. Over to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Susan. Is my voice coming through loud and clear? Great. Well, uh, thanks to the Canadian International Council, Ben, Brad, Emmett, for uh, organizing this event at an uncertain uh, and difficult moment, as Susan noted, uh, in where Canada and China are uh, uh, coexisting at, uh, at, a, at, a, at a tough time. Uh, the new age of Sino-Canadian relations. Well, I'm not sure what the new age is going to look like. That's uh, a little too soon to tell, but I think we can agree that the old age, uh, the, the land that we have, the territory we've occupied for much of the last 50 years is passing or, uh, or crumbling. We have a more assertive and authoritarian China in the uh, Xi Jinping era. We have an erratic and disruptive US in a, in a Donald Trump era. We have what appears to be the end of hyper-globalization that's brought upon us by the, by the pandemic that has us connecting through this way today. Uh, and as Susan mentioned, we have a bilateral impasse, a quagmire of major proportions in the issue related to Meng Wanzhou and, and our two Michaels. Uh, what can we say about what is coming in the transition to that new age that may lie beyond? Well, first is that the consensus around engagement as practiced and envisioned for almost for most of the last 50 years is both challenged and broken. Uh, there has been withering criticism at multiple levels in Canada and an avalanche of negativity about China and the relationship. Uh, we have not yet had a structured response by the Trudeau government, but rather a series of ad hoc responses to individual issues and pressures. And I think all of us know how difficult it is to create a China strategy or approach at any time, but particularly in this era of such deep uncertainties on multiple fronts. What is clear is that there's a very clear chill in public opinion in uh, the polling that we have. Uh, and um, that is unmistakable even as we're kind of holding our breath, waiting for something to come out of Ottawa, which is rather unlikely, I think, this fall. But significant decisions are pending regarding Huawei. And I think those are going to be the harbinger of an approach, at least on the dimension of technological decoupling and where we're going to position on the, um, uh, the American-led uh, confrontation with China. But here at home, the chill in public opinion and public discourse is crystal clear. Uh, we need more polling on this, but I think it's unmistakable that um, the, the attitudes of Canadians are at a position that makes the old engagement approach unsustainable. Uh, and in combination, we've, we've kind of reached a tripping point, excuse me, a tipping point of trust. Uh, and some are coming to the view that China is enemy, adversary, and an existential threat to Canadian sovereignty, values, and institutions. We don't know if that's a majority opinion, it's unlikely, but it is now part of our body politics discussion. The old rationale is not holding. We can no longer rely on economic advantage uh, alone, the, the lure of the market as a sustaining factor, we can't believe in faith in socializing China into a liberal world order of our design. Uh, and uh, we, can't, we can't sustain the hope that economic and social opening will lead to convergence on our terms. 
So while um, our hard-nosed diplomats like Gordon Holden and Susan Gregson never held to those simple views, that was the kind of basic foundation that was the social contract between politicians and the Canadian public. Well, what can we expect in the next few months? Uh, first is I expect stalemate on the Mung Wing, Mung, excuse me, Mung Wanzhou and our two Michaels issue. A made in Ottawa solution is now out of the question. There's unlikely to be movement in Washington before their election. And even if Biden wins, it will be many months before America can solve our particular problem, if it does at all. There's no sign of unilateral Chinese action to improve conditions or release of our two individuals. And um, some kind of understanding about mutual actions between Ottawa and Beijing doesn't now seem to be in the cards. In fact, both sides are painted into a corner that's going to make that difficult. Neither side is trying to escalate tensions, but it is clear, as Susan indicated, they sit on a fragile base at this moment and could go south very quickly uh, if uh, uh, things are not handled very carefully. As we have seen is what has happened in Australia-China relations in the last, uh, over the last two years, but particularly in the last two months. Uh, I think the second thing that is clear is that we are going to see much sharper criticism of our current government's approach, the liberal government's approach. It's already visible in the special parliamentary committee and what I find most interesting is that some of that criticism uh, is based on uh, the, the two Michaels situation. It's also based on a series of concerns about Chinese domestic issues and foreign policy. But it is also heavily focused on concerns about Chinese influence and interference, what some even call infiltration activities here. And I suspect we're going to be in a context over the next few, few months where the public discussion may take an even more nasty turn. Not just about policy differences that we'll be talking about today, but about the integrity and loyalty of individuals and groups seen as pro-engagement. The elite capture thesis is starting to slip into our public discussion in a way we have not had in past in our debates about China. And it's something we have to watch very carefully, lest it slip into McCarthyism of an earlier era. We're going to be an era of considerable thinking and debate about that new narrative, that new framework, uh, in, in, informed by an understanding of a new strategic setting, this new public mood, and the policies of others. Uh, we are very close to the United States in a number of ways, even if we don't like what they're doing, the paranoia, the extremism of their positions on China, but it's an unmistakable force in our options. But I think where we're going to be looking most carefully as we, we get into this period of intense discussion is Australia, the United Kingdom, where a wonderful new report has just come out, and Singapore. My own view is that we need to outline in this debate a nuanced mix of competition and cooperation continue with some form of engagement rather than containment, Cold War or decoupling, reframe the objective as living with China rather than changing China, and pursuing three categories of action in cooperating with China where we can, talking where there are prospects of bridging major differences, and pushing back where we must to defend Canadian values, interests, and citizens. Uh, this will, I, I think we'll be looking at a case by case, not a broad characterization of friend or enemy, adversary as partner. Less dreams of what might be than harder pragmatic interests at the fore. Well, we'll be talking about major foreign policy issues, domestic repression in China, uh, military modernization, China and international organization. A lot of issues there. But I wanted to use my last three minutes to speak about one particular element of the relationship. I think we all realize that in this time of difficult government to government interactions, uncertainties in political leadership, uh, that it's the civil society business and people to people relations that are most fundamental. And I think we have to work hardest to maintain in difficult circumstances. 
And one of those sectors is our universities. Uh, over the, uh, for since at least the 1980s and, and earlier for student exchanges, one of our biggest and most successful sinews of connection with China, uh, the university linkages, now face very difficult set of concerns. Worries about pressure and mobilization of Chinese students on our campuses, over-dependence on tuition revenue that, replace, that may, at least some perceive, as um, uh, biasing the, uh, what they have to say about China, cyber intrusions, diversion of intellectual property, end use of research. These are all real issues, uh, uh, even if the prescription is not, as some Americans are arguing, to cut the cord. Each of those issues that I just mentioned is subject to hyperbole and sensationalism. And strangely, they have generated very little informed discussion in our media or, or even on our campuses. But for universities to continue in their role as a bridge between China and Canada, we're going to need more awareness of some of the risks and problems that are attendant with that cooperation, better interaction with our security agencies in Ottawa uh, so that we come to common understandings rather than Ottawa enforcing particular rules as has happened in the United States. We're going to need more vigilant about violations of academic freedom and integrity and complete transparency from our institutions on what their interactions are, financial and other, with Chinese counterparts. Uh, and we're going to need the negotiation of new ground rules with Chinese partners on managing issues related to Thousand Talents program and some other parts that probably, I feel, are not uh, detrimental to what we're doing, but there is the perception that they are detrimental that we have to negotiate. We also have to have much more due diligence about who our partners are in China in research collaborations and the end use of our research. Again, not to close doors open, but to keep doors open uh, to uh, large scale student recruitment, academic ex exchanges and research co collaborations. We're going to need to close some windows and install some new screens, especially in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, medicine as well. So um, I would end with uh, one special caution, that as we open up this issue in the universities, as we become better able to have a balanced discussion on the threats we face from Chinese involvement in, uh, on our shores, inside our country, it is essential that we avoid stigmatization of people of Chinese descent. As these issues have played out in the United States and Australia, I think it's fair to say there have been some terribly unwanted and in, maybe inadvertent outcomes, uh, a chill that um, isn't what we're going to need to keep this fundamental pillar in our relationship with China intact. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. And now I'll turn to Gordon Holden. Thank you, Susan. I'm happy to uh, speak to the CIC audience. I'm, I'm a firm believer in the importance of informed citizenry. And despite the fact having spent most of my adult life working for what is now Global Affairs Canada, I'd argue that foreign policy is too important to leave to the national capital and that it really does need an informed citizenry and a lively debate amongst the population. Um, a couple of really simple things I'd say at the very beginning, and I appreciated uh, actually um, Paul's nod to the fact that some of us, Susan, myself at least, were not naive about the nature of China. That is always um, one of the risks I was musing with Paul recently about a book called China Hands, which was written in the 1970s that spoke of the demonization of the American State Department and broader governmental expertise on Asia and what damaging effect that had on the United States where they ended up, in my opinion, flying blind for a decade or longer. Uh, I am concerned that uh, the debate remains civil and that, it, uh, that civil servants who must necessarily defend government's policy um, one, rec one needs to recognize that behind the scenes there's often a ferocious debate 
I can recall debates like that when, when Susan and I were in the embassy in Beijing in the 1980s. These were really fundamental things. Nuclear China, should we have an aid program? Should we not? Can you change China? Can you change it significantly? Does Canada matter in that equation? Uh, those sorts of debates were alive then. They're not brand new. But I think there needs to be three things. One, a nature of realism. Um, secondly, an acknowledgement that this isn't all in our own hands, that as Paul hinted at or spoke directly to, other parties have a major role. And, and thirdly, the eternal challenge for a medium-sized power, how to balance conflicting objectives, trade and human rights, for example, investment and strategic concerns. This is not easily done, and particularly not by modest-sized countries. It's hard enough for the case of the United States, which right now has massive uh, investment by multilateral corporations, and yet is um, putting strong pressure on, on China regarding the South China Sea, Taiwan, and other issues. A traditional mistake made, I think, by planners, but also the public, is the idea that China is an inert object on which foreign states can draw. And that hasn't been the case for the latter half of the 20th century, certainly not the case in the 21st century, where we now have a powerful state with internal dynamics that drive its policies and developments far more than do external actors. I include the United States or the EU, quite frankly, in that, let alone Canada. It's frustrating for Canadians and policymakers in Canada to accept that China will influence us and change Canada more likely, more in the 21st century than we will China. That's not something Canadians like to hear. Well, we are who we are. Uh, we'll try and influence our, our partners far, um, but the idea that they will be changing us in significant ways is something that we tend to uh, reject out of hand. Um, that means, I think, that we need to keep expectations modest. Canada, despite our missionary impulse, uh, is not going to remake China. Doesn't mean we can't change. We, can't make, we can make changes in the margins, but modesty in our expectations is important. Secondly, Canada-China policy doesn't exist in a vacuum, and it can't be created as if it were a vacuum. As Paul has noted, U.S.-China relations, easily the most significant bilateral relationship on Earth, is affecting Canada-China relations now and will continue to do so. Uh, this was true in the language that the KUSMA, or USMAC if you prefer, the new free trade agreement, there's a clause in there that in effect is, ties our hands to some extent in terms of uh, a future free trade agreement with a non-market economy, which certainly will be the U.S. argument. Um, we've seen U.S. pressure on Canada regarding investments on Huawei. We've seen it uh, with regard to U.S. fears that Canada will be the back door through which Chinese goods or semi-finished Chinese goods will enter the, the U.S. market. Um, those concerns will not disappear. They will intensify. And the U.S. watches very closely Canadian transactions right down to the individual firm. Uh, my institute maintains the most detailed um, database on Chinese investment in this country. And I know for a fact that draws close scrutiny from our American natives, uh, neighbors. Third, uh, it's an ongoing challenge for Canada is that there are multiple interests in play at any given moment. Um, this is a classic dilemma. And I find maybe a little bit like the blind mind and the elephant, uh, people who are concerned about trade say, whoa, we live by, by exports. And that's true. Here's the percentage in GD, of GDP generated by trade. Uh, US 24, China 37, Canada 64. I mean, we live or die by our trade. Now, fortunately, you could say, or unfortunately, depending on perspective, 75% of those exports go to the United States. But if you're a softwood lumber uh, uh, exporter or aluminum, uh, you realize that's not an easy trade. So trade, yes, to the forefront. If you're a canola farmer on the prairies, you're hurting right now because of, of a um, curbs on our exports of canola to, Europe, to China's market. Not in my opinion, entirely generated by the Meng Wanzhou case, but certainly that I think that is a factor. Human rights. Uh, we are a country where our public in particular expects us to live our values in foreign policy, uh, and that's fine. But are we going to expect that Chinese practices in Xinjiang are going to change tomorrow? Um, a decade, two decades 
of efforts by Canada to change Chinese behavior in Tibet, in my view, drew virtually no visible, had virtually no visible effect. There was some positive effect when we had small projects in, in Tibet that helped individuals, individual communities perhaps, but on broad Chinese policies, I don't think so. Immigration, China has been a major along with India and the Philippines, a major um, generator of, of immigration that has given us to our great benefit, almost 2 million Canadians of Chinese origin that has not changed. But as Paul hinted at, that has led to a measure of, of, of um, complexity. Um, parts of that community very much wish for a far better relationship between Ottawa and Beijing. Other parts are sharply critical, particularly those who are coming from those who have come from Hong Kong or need I say Taiwan, although they wouldn't wish to have that as part of the greater China uh, calculation. Uh, international security concerns, which I will stay away from, Jim Boutilia will cover in due course. Um, China is, uh, has uh, the largest Navy on earth, the largest army on earth, maybe technically inferior, um, soldier per soldier or, or sailor per sailor, air for aircraft per aircraft, but the quality is improving quickly. Any calculation or risk of war um, will draw us into a defense calculation of the United States. How do you balance that? Domestic security concerns, Paul hinted at, um, interference, influence, um, outright IP theft or espionage. Uh, these are very difficult things because they're inherently negative to juggle. How can you send a trade delegation, promote trade, or at the same time, your bureaucrats are wrestling with a question related to IP theft or unwanted internal, unjustified internal influence. These are mature economies, mature countries that have been great powers for hundreds of years are quite used to that, quite frankly. Um, it's rather new for Canada or difficult for Canada. U.S. relationship, again, whoever wins, that, that will, China will be a major factor. I don't expect that relationship to improve quickly. But I will say this, and I still have a couple of minutes. Um, I have a great concern that we may be sliding towards a new Cold War. Uh, the first part of my career was forged by the later stages of the Cold War between NATO and the Soviet Union. We look back on that, perhaps we in the West with satisfaction. The good guys won, the bad guys lost. There was no Holocaust, none of that happened. But that was not an automatic thing. It could have ended very badly. And it wasn't just the Cuban Missile Crisis. There were periods under Brezhnev and other, other phases where we could have ended up with a very different result, one that would have been civilization threatening. So yes, we may end up there. We may end up under US leadership and with our defense commitments and NORAD and NATO in a confrontation that looks and feels like a, US, like a Cold War, but the risks are great. And if that were to be the case, there would be Canadians hoping we can backpedal and, and modify and mollify uh, US concerns to the point that we can avoid Holocaust. I'll stop there on that negative note. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gordon. Very thought provoking uh, ideas there. Uh, we'll turn now to Lynette. Um, thank you very much um, for, uh, to, to CIC for the invitation. I'm very pleased uh, to be here today with my very esteemed colleagues who have been observers of you know, Canada-China relations for a long, long time. And thanks very much to Susan uh, for, for chairing the panel. Um, so let me make three big points. Um, so up until I think the, the arrest of uh, Meng in December 2018, Canada-China relations since the mid 2000s have vacillated from what I see as from an exclusive focus on China's human rights record under, under Stephen Harper's conservative government, that is from 2006 to 2015, to a trade-friendly engagement policy under Justin Trudeau's uh, liberal government. Um, so I think neither of the ex extreme policies towards China is, is actually quite, quite helpful because I think China is a, is a very complex and rising power that you know, my fellow panelists, both uh, Paul and Gordon have addressed. And, and I think ex extreme policies typically reflect a, 
uh, shall I say, a, a, a lack of appreciation for, for the complex world out, out there and the implications for medium-sized uh, democracy like Canada. And I think over the last uh, seven years or so, China has seen increased power centralization and tightening of social control. And with these you know, political uh, developments, Canada-China relations are increasingly characterized by incompatibility in political ideologies and values. And yes, we started with different ideologies, but I think that has just been exaggerated uh, in the last five to seven years. And at the same time, and I think China has unequivocally ended its uh, foreign policy doctrine of biding its time, which, em which emboldened the policymakers to exert its influence in the domestic politics of uh, foreign countries. But, at, but I think at the, at the same time, we also need to acknowledge that you know, bilateral trade and investment, education exchanges and other people to people linkages remain quite important. And I think on, on, the bilateral, on, on a multilateral basis, China remains an important player in achieving any meaningful breakthrough in climate change mitigation and global health, uh, public health responses to COVID-19. In my view, it is actually impossible to navigate Canada-China relations without taking into consideration the US-China relations that have overshadowed it, which you know, my fellow panelists have also mentioned that. And I think Canada lives in an increasingly bipolarized world, which is caught in between you know, new superpower rivalry. Um, and this superpower rivalry is not exactly divided along the line of ideology at the last Cold War Wars. And I think among Hmong's incident uh, suggests that whatever course of action Canada takes actually will involve significant trade-offs between our varied national interests. This is a time onwards that we cannot actually have everything uh, at the same time. We need to pick and choose. Um, in the post-pandemic era, I feel that you know, the electoral cost of getting the China policy wrong has actually increased significantly for the Liberal government. And I will explain that in a the, in the minute. So, so on, on to US-China relations. I, I think some of US re, uh, relations, bilateral relations is increasingly characterized by that of strategic competition. At the symbolic level, you have Donald Trump's mantra of making China, America great again, and that's matched by President Xi's ambition of making China great again, or the China dream. Um, and then you have strong nationalism in both countries, partly fanned by the respective leaders. I think further field public sentiment, right? And, and, and that in turn pushed policymakers into taking more increasingly extreme measures. And that is reflected in the academia, voices in the academia. You have the realists, you know, championed by John Mershon, Mershon who has been saying this for over a decade, saying that you know, the US really contained China by building coalitions with various China's neighbors. On the other hand, you also have a bunch of constructivists as well as uh, China specialists in the base in the United States who have, who have studied, who have spent decades studying China. So last year, last July, they wrote a joint letter, uh, published a joint uh, piece in the Washington Post, basically saying that look, uh, we think, you know, United States should still continue to engage with China, even though we acknowledge that, you know, it is going to become an increasingly repressive and assertive regime. U.S. interests are still best served by working alongside other nations, uh, as well as with multilateral institutions, rather than seeking to undermine or contain China. So, in summary, I, I, I think tensions between the two countries, U.S. and China, are driven by competition, for global technological uh, dominance, as well as, as well as incompatibility of political ideologies. US obviously has serious concerns over China's industrial policy that is the Made in China 2025, which US has alleged that is created an uneven level playing field for, China, for Chinese and foreign companies in the high tech sector. But at the heart of it, at, even at the heart of the core of the trade war, are really concerns over forced technology trans, uh, transfer, intellectual pro uh, property theft, and lack of market access. So this is a, this, so these are issues of government behavior as well as a reflection of political ideology. Like what constitutes you know 
intellectual property theft. Um, and if you look at, you know, U.S. Um, voice against Huawei, it, part of it is reflection of its concern over Huawei's ownership structure, asserting that it could, Huawei could really be a state-owned firm with links to the military rather than an employee firm it proclaims to be. But to someone like me who studies Chinese politics, um, I think that argument is well overblown because by the virtue of the Chinese communist system, all domestic firms are subject to the behest of the party, right? And the recently passed the, the foreign espionage law and national intelligence law, I think they merely legalize what will likely take place when the party decides to forcefully assert its control over private entities. Um, so suffice to say that I think the US-China relations is characterized by that of strategic competition, which will only intensify in the coming years. And from China's perspective, I think Meng's arrest in Vancouver is seen as Canada doing America's bidding, a trans-border extension of America's jurisdiction, purely aimed at containing the ambition of uh, China, you know, containing the growth of a company that represents national pride. And therefore, we are siding with the United States uh, with its unfair uh, trade competition uh, behavior. Um, but in fact, you know, you know, I think Canada's relationship with China is actually different in character and is not rooted in a hit on competition for dominance, which characterized that of Sino-US relations. So I think logically it follows that Canada should then chart a course of action independent of the United States. And I think actions could be on a sectoral or issue by issue basis, uh, taking into full consideration of what is actually in Canada's best, best interest. And the need for an independent course of action is actually amplified by President Trump's very mercurial policies. You might remember a couple of months ago, he banned 3M from exporting face masks to Canada. That's at the height of the pandemic. Um, so on to Sino-US, uh, Sino-Canadian uh, relationship. I think for a long time, China's foreign policy has been guided by Deng Xiaoping's dictum of, you know, hide your capacities and bide your time, which kept the country out of the international limelight to concentrate in its, its effort in making its, its, itself strong. And now under Xi Jinping, it's extremely clear, exceedingly clear that China has abandoned forbearance. In fact, it has emboldened uh, to assert its, its, its effort in a range of areas from the South China Sea, cross-strait relations, Hong Kong, as well as other territories, right? Election meddling, espionage, spying on foreign countries have all been alleged in countries ranging from Canada to Australia to, to smaller nations. But at the same time, I think, let's not lose track of, of the fact that um, given increased urbanization and the size of its growing middle class, trade and investment with China, I think, still hold up promise despite uh, various, various concerns. Um, I'm running out of time, so just let me say briefly um, two, two points. I think I th we, we, we often like to you know, pat ourselves on the shoulder and say that you know, Canada is now alone now, now that we are caught in between these two powers and we have got uh, various uh, several Canadians being detained by, by China. Um, and, and, and I think after pandemic, we see this, this shift in public opinion poll against China that has actually risen. Those in favor of China has actually fallen. I think these letters should to, to, to I think the liberal government should think about, you know, various policies with, with China. I think, you know, it, it, the pandemic has afforded the liberal government to take tougher actions, which was, I think, previously unjustified because of higher costs imposed on certain sectors, uh, such as sectors that are dependent on China. I think it has, the pandemic has also raised the electoral cost of the margin of error on all decisions related to China. And this has inevitable consequence on Canada's 5G, uh, this, uh, 5G decision. I will, uh, I will leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lynette. And now uh, to Jim Boutillier. Over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Susan. 
let me come back to a point which all of the previous speakers have alluded to, and that's the profound transformation in the nature of the Chinese regime in the past seven or eight years since uh, Xi Jinping came to power. Because I think that we are faced with an entirely new set of challenges, ones that were disguised in the 20 or 30 years before when we were mesmerized by the stellar growth of the Chinese economy. But now we see a China which is repressive at home and aggressive abroad, predatory and totalitarian, some would even suggest fascist at home. The character of the regime in China is now one which causes us to step back and reassess, not only in Ottawa, but in the chancelleries around the world, how should we proceed in addressing China? I would suggest that the Chinese are triumphalist on the basis of their remarkable accomplishments, but also profoundly insecure in their international outlook. A vast and increasingly powerful country which is essentially friendless. A country which can only explain its own shortcomings by reference to dark forces maneuvering internally or on the margins. And we saw that narrative play out with respect to events in Hong Kong. At the same time, I would suggest that the Chinese see history on their side, that the United States has entered a period of inexorable decline. And this seems to be underscored by the mercurial nature of the Trump regime in Washington. There has, in short, been a profound change in the nature of the regime we're dealing with and a concentration of power at the center in Beijing, which is not only a metaphor for those changes, but also arguably a source of enormous weakness downstream. What we've seen uh, in 2013 with uh, uh, Xi's statement, and parenthetically, there is now a suggestion that Xi is maneuvering to become Chairman Xi uh, in the mold of the great Chairman Mao, that Xi in Kazakhstan announced the Belt and Road. What exactly is the Belt and Road, which spans the Indian Ocean and the Eurasian landmass? Is it a way of enhancing Chinese influence? Is it a way of building Xi's reputation because he seems to be endlessly ambitious, ambitious to become part of the great triumvirate in the sky of Mao, Deng, and Xi? Or is it a way of ensuring that excess capacity in the Chinese economy continues to be utilized? Or is it, in fact, a series of Trojan horses which enable uh, the Chinese to penetrate states throughout the Asian landmass and into Europe and Africa. It's a dynamic construct which continues to grow with Arctic Silk Road, a Silk Road which now leads off into the Pacific Ocean and is a source of mounting concern to uh, the Australians and New Zealanders. But it highlights in a way something which is truly remarkable, and that's that while the Middle Kingdom construct remains in place, uh, the Chinese are doing what they've never done before, and that's to reach out into the global community to a degree unknown, I think, in Ch Chinese history. Also, accompanying that, reflecting it and advancing it is the growth, as Gordon Holden suggested, of the People's Liberation Army Navy. At no time in Chinese history have the Chinese ever embarked on a naval expansion of the sort that we've witnessed in the past 35 years. And indeed, in the first eight months of 2019, the Chinese launched more warships than the entire Canadian Navy. And indeed, in the period from 2015 to 2019, they launched a sufficient number of ships to rival the French, British, Spanish, and Italian navies. What we've seen is the emergence for the first time in the Western Pacific of a global naval superpower. 
one can argue theologically about quality and quantity, but for the first time, the United States is now faced with a maritime challenge. And of course, we're looking at a quintessentially maritime arena of competition, a maritime challenge which has caused the Pentagon and the White House to reflect deeply on its failures over the past decade and a half to continue enhancing uh, American military might. And also, of course, it focuses attention on areas of Chinese activity, for example, the South China Sea. I think if I were a Chinese strategist, I would focus on the South China Sea as well. But what has happened, of course, as all of you are aware, is that the Chinese have built up a series of artificial features uh, over and against the claims, rightly or wrongly, of littoral states. And of course, they have flown in the face of the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling in July of 2016, which maintains that Chinese claims are effectively uh, without validity, without foundation. That, of course, in turn, brings us face to face with another challenge in the security and governance and diplomacy arena, and that is the question of the rules-based international order. How are we to proceed when, in fact, a state which is a signatory of UNCLOS, in fact, adopts an a la carte approach to whether to accept rulings or not? Now, one can say that there are many other signatories to international conventions who caveat uh, their uh, ration, uh, rationalize or the rationalization or membership in those uh, treaties. But the fact of the matter remains that across the board, rules-based issues are now becoming a major source of concern in terms of how we deal with uh, China. And this spreads on into the East China Sea, into the Himalayan frontiers with India, into concerns in Europe uh, about what are the long-term uh, security ambitions and goals of China. We see that this raises a series of concerns, both strategic and practical, in terms of how to deal with uh, the growing weight of uh, Chinese military power. Coming closer to home, uh, that of course means that uh, Canadians must uh, think long and hard what is to be their position in the event of hostilities in Asian waters? And more specifically, what will happen, for example, with respect to Taiwan, should there be uh, hostilities involving uh, that island nation? Uh, we would be placed in an awkward position, to say the least, in terms of our relationship with some of the principal players like the United States and the Japanese over and against Taiwan. What's also a source of concern, I would suggest, is what I would call the revolutionary calendar. That is to say that next year is the 100th anniversary of the creation of the Chinese Communist Party uh, in uh, 1921. And of course, farther on, we have 2049, which is, will be the 100th anniversary of the creation of the People's Republic of China. Does Xi feel a mounting pressure uh, to, in fact, uh, bring into the Chinese fold Taiwan uh, within that framework, uh, within those dates, the bookends of 2021 and 2049. And what will this mean in terms of peace and stability in Asia? Uh, we are at on a knife's edge in many respects, uh, whether in the Himalayas or in the South China Sea, the slightest miscalculation could have very serious and worrisome results. Coming to uh, Canada, I would suggest that we have been remarkably naive over the years about the true nature of the Chinese regime. It's very easy to demonize a great power on the rise, but I think that we have in many cases been the victims of our own sweet reasonableness. Eager to assist, eager to transform, but naive in terms of what we as a modest a sized middle power can achieve. What we're also suffering from, I would suggest, is a simplistic binary vision of peace and war. 
we've had the great privilege of enjoying peace, and war is a distinct phenomenon. But I would suggest that increasingly we're dealing with a regime which is eager to harness all of the different attributes of the state to advance its interests in gray zone operations. And we saw those, of course, in the South China Sea. We see it at work day by day in the East China Sea, the effort to wear down Japanese resistance with respect to, for example, the Senkaku Islands. So we're dealing with a completely different type of regime in terms of the way it functions, and as Lynette suggested, in terms of critical issues like values. What should our position be, for example, on Xinjiang, on the Uyghur detentions, and so forth? But as Gordon quite rightly pointed out, uh, 20 years of uh, heartfelt uh, activity on behalf of the Tibetans seemed outwardly to have accomplished remarkably little. What then are we to do? I would suggest three things very quickly in keeping with the formula. One is that we should advance uh, the re and reduce our dependency on China. Uh, this is part of a larger diversification that should occur and I think will occur. Uh, decoupling um, is perhaps an extreme term, but what the coronavirus has highlighted are the dangers involved in overdependency. Uh, further, uh, we should work together as middle powers. I think that the experience of Australia, and just this morning I received an email from a senior colleague in Canberra who wrote, quote, for Canada, neither distance nor decency will protect you from the PRC's appalling behavior, end quote. The Australians are faced with many of the same challenges we are, but their trade dependency on China is far greater than ours, but we need to work together as middle powers. There's a great community and we have failed. We either hang separately or hang together, and I would recommend the latter. And we need to think much more seriously about how a international military crisis will tax us. We are entirely, I think, unprepared for the scale and the challenges involved should there sadly be uh, hostilities in Asian waters. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, so we've had some uh, very thought-provoking uh, discussion from our panelists, and uh, I think this has been a, a very excellent launch for this, uh, for this evening. So um, I know that uh, the audience uh, will be sending in some questions. I have a couple of questions already, but and would encourage uh, people to continue to send their, their questions on in. But I'll start off with one that I've got. Um, now, uh, I, I, we've, we've talked about uh, the Canadian uh, public reaction to what's going on in China. We've talked about um, Canadians being increasingly uneasy about the direction China is taking interference in Canada and so forth. And some, um, there, in some quarters, there have been recommendations that Canada really, you know, show China um, what we're made of, uh, that we impose sanctions against China, uh, expel diplomats, um, invoke the Magnitsky Act, refuse student visas, and so forth. Um, and so I'd like to get uh, panelists' views on th these kinds of recommendations and whether you think that that's uh, the way to go or what you would will propose um, if, if you don't agree with that, what you, what you would propose the communication be in that regard. So, um, Gordon, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Well, you list a series of things, and I will pick up on one straight away. Uh, deny Chinese students visas. Um, to me, that would be a self-inflicted um, wound. Our universities very much need the money. It's reality. Uh, international students pay, pay well. But more importantly, I think, don't expect that Chinese students returning to China will make China into some sort of uh, Canadian-style democracy. Not at all. But historically, we have seen that outside influences can change China to some extent, not to really make it in our, in our image. So that to me would be, would be an error. Secondly, expect China to retaliate. In other words, come up with that smorgasbord if you wish. If you wish, but if you're going to have a long list of eight or 10 or 12 things, expect China have its own list as well. If you're not careful, you could end up in a downward spiral. 
But I'd say each individual item on that list ought to be carefully thought of. And as hinted by Jim Boutillier, or said by Jim Boutillier, um, better we hang together. Uh, we cannot significantly influence Chinese behavior internationally by ourselves. Where we can act in conjunction with others, we, we increase the chance that it may have an effect. So act with others, be careful what you put on that list so we're not actually uh, hurting ourselves and expect retaliation. Thanks, Gordon. Paul, did you have any thoughts on that? I did, and it's on the matter of, uh, I think all of us see a variety of Chinese actions domestically uh, on the periphery and uh, internationally where pushback is necessary. And I think hostage diplomacy is perhaps um, close to the top of that list for, for Canada. But, <clears throat> and the, the prescription that um, we're not going to get very far pursuing this unilaterally or in our relationship with China, we need to work with others is unmistakably true, but it's, it's insufficient. Uh, and the difficulty of mobilizing coalitions against China on Xinjiang, uh, on Hong Kong, is, uh, are enormous. When we find there are not many partners out there willing to take on China directly. Having said that, I think the most important thing Ottawa can do is look at the pattern of those multinational coalitions. What is the best way to make them effective? Um, the direct megaphone uh, is probably not best, uh, but rather are there ways that we can pull other like-minded countries into ongoing observation and pressure against China for what it does? And I want to I want to make one one key point here: is that like-minded doesn't necessarily just mean with uh, Western liberal democracies. Um, the necessity of working with Southeast Asians, the necessity of working with a number of other countries that are very worried about a variety of Chinese behaviors, uh, but that um, uh, don't want to take them on individually. I think our way forward is coalitions on diplomatic issues, with ASEAN countries, Singapore and others, and that it's not going to be our traditional way of confrontation. It is going to be encirclement of Chinese on these matters, expression regularly of the costs of what they are doing to them, and a rule-based order that I think ultimately China wants to buy a big piece of. Thanks, Paul. Jim, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I do, Susan. I think that uh, while it may be simplistic, uh, concessions are in many ways an invitation to coercion in our relationship with China. That um, we, of course, uh, live in a culture which is given to compromise and compromises at the heart of many diplomatic exchanges, but uh, weakness uh, in many cases translates to our disadvantage and that uh, we do need to be resolute, uh, particularly in view of the mounting evidence of the punitive and vindictive nature of uh, Chinese foreign policy. One has only to see the way in which the Chinese have uh, treated uh, the Swedes uh, not so long ago, have uh, treated the Germans in terms of direct threats, uh, despite the fact that Wang Yi uh, maintains as Chinese foreign minister that China never interferes in the affairs of other states. Uh, and there's a long additional catalog of bullying. Um, so I would certainly endorse what uh, Gordon and uh, Paul have said, that uh, it needs to be a, a, a coalition and, and not just of the Western powers, although there are some uh, leading candidates in that uh, community. Uh, I think that uh, we do need to work hard to highlight the profound inadequacies of uh, Chinese foreign policy. And the Chinese propaganda machine grinds relentlessly 24 hours a day. It's quite appalling the sort of assertions that come out of uh, Beijing in their, whether it's the China Daily or Global Times, 
and so forth. We need to be combating those uh, at every turn. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Lynette. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, yes, if I could divide the smallest board of actions that you suggested earlier, that you post in your, in, in, in your questions, I, I, I think to me, some of them serve symbolic purposes, things like the Minsky Act, right? And others are more concrete, substantive type of actions. And don't get me wrong, I, I think, you know, international diplomacy sometimes is all about symbolism. It's all about sending signals and, and, and putting out symbolism. Sometimes symbolism is all that is in, in international uh, diplomacy. But if you think about what Minsky Act does, it, it creates what I think, you know, inconvenience for certain officials that you, you impose on, but there are various ways to kind of to, to skirt around those, uh, those sanctions. So as far as Hong Kong issues is concerned, I, I think more substantively, more, more helpful for the future of Hong Kong is to, you know, to really to attract the talent and help keep the talent that um, includes uh, changing our immigration policies and expediting some of the applications that are coming through to, to Canada. And on the uh, issue of, on the question of working with allies, I, I, I agree with, with Paul entirely. It should not be just about Western allies. Um, Southeast Asian countries, I think for a long time, has been caught in between two superpowers, right? I, I think they have so much more experience in playing the game of balancing and hedging, you know, US versus, uh, versus China. I think there's a lot of um, notes and, and experience that, 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 that we can actually exchange. But I do think, you know, perhaps there are things going on in Ottawa that I do not see. I, I do think that, you know, Canada has lost six months of windows of opportunities. Um, pandemic, uh, I, I think when we see excess casualties in March, April, going up in every country, probably because you know cover up in China. I think that was kind of the best time to broach this issue of building an alliance. I don't want to call it a united front because it's a politically loaded word, but, mm -hmm. but there are issues that we can work with various partners. Some countries, we align with them on certain things, other countries on other issues, right? But I think, you know, six months, we, we, we lost this golden opportunities of, of uh, win, window, I would argue. Um, which I think, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but, you know, going forward, you, you, you saw Wang Yi was in Europe uh, two weeks or a week ago, trying to get uh, European countries to come together to build an alliance versus to fight against the United States. We can do that. China can do that too. Uh, the question is, how can we do it quietly and effectively without alerting China to what we do? Um, it's a it's it's a very interesting game of uh, of diplomacy and uh, and interaction, and I suspect it's going to take a lot of skills, a lot of diplomatic skills. Which you know, I'm not sure uh, if I could be frank. I'm not sure whether Ottawa has that capacity. Now. Okay. Well, as a former diplomat, I'll try not to take offense at that. <laughs> um, so we've got a number of uh, very interesting questions from our audience. So one from Paul Meyer uh, for uh, Jim Boutillier in particular. Do you think the Royal Canadian Navy should be participating in freedom of navigation patrols? And if so, do we have the capacity to do so? Thank you, Paul. That's an excellent question. And uh, yes and yes, I think, are the answers to the two uh, situations that you highlighted. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, taken part in um, Fawn Ops uh, that, for the audience, are freedom of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea. We have, in fact, transited the Taiwan Strait by way of Lynette's uh, diplomacy symbols. Or, uh, we um, have not, in my private estimation, been nearly as assertive as we should have been because uh, without risk of getting into the fine tuning of international law, uh, the artificial features in the South China Sea occupied by the Chinese do not uh, in fact possess maritime territory which would normally be associated with an island elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we could in fact 
sail a good deal closer to these uh, features to indicate that uh, the uh, claims uh, lack legitimacy. Um, you can be certain that the Chinese uh, response will be instantaneous and loud, uh, but uh, we uh, certainly have the capacity and have on occasion over the years, uh, in fact, uh, exercised that uh, in uh, uh, East Asian waters. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we've got a question from Keith Maxwell. Chinese influence operations in Canada in terms of intimidation, infiltration, intrusive surveillance of citizens, attempts to influence our elections, and use of hired protesters are concerning to many Canadians. The security community have outlined several specific instances of these sorts of adversarial intrusions inside Canada. How should Canada respond to this threat? Paul, I see you nodding. Do, do you want to start off? Yeah, happy, and I'm, I'm glad this is raised because I think that in panels like this over the last two years, uh, it's become clear that there is greater awareness uh, of certain Chinese actions, some by the government, some by patriotic Chinese. Attribution is complicated, but there's no question that this is on the mind of Canadians. And I think it shows up in the polling we've done at UBC. It also simply shows up in what people um, uh, are saying uh, to us when, when we talk about the China challenge. It is these matters. And I think that the first thing is we need more information and more vigilance uh, on what may be occurring in a variety of different sectors. I mentioned the universities for one, um, and just to use that as the example, uh, mobilization of Chinese students, surveillance of Chinese students, there are examples of this happening. And we're trying to, in an ad hoc way, step by step, learn about these better so that we can point a spotlight on them and react to them. But I would say this, that on balance, uh, the kinds of suggestions at the level, the intensity, the number of those activities in Canada, in the universities, in the first dimension, is not the same as in Australia. Um, we found that uh, in our meetings, we go back and forth with our Australian friends who say, this is going on in our campuses. It must be going on in yours. And what we're finding is that there are examples, uh, but there are not many examples. So putting this into a sense of proportion, how big this actually is, as we respond to it, we need more evidence and more openness in the discussion. And, and finally, on this matter of... Um, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, interference activities. When we're looking for what countries have been responding most actively to this, Australia comes close to the top of the list. Uh, Australia has put in place new legislation, new offices to monitor and intervene against Chinese interference. And my, my own position is that we may have problems, they may not be to the same degree as the Australians, and that at this stage, I don't see the case for new legislation that is necessary to deal with this, but rather with a little bit more resources, more open discussion on some of these matters. Our biggest antidote against these activities uh, are our Chinese Canadian communities and how we interact with them, uh, rather than through new legislative means coming from Ottawa, some new enforcement uh, resources are going to be necessary and a little bit more courage in pushing back, but not to go the Australian route of, um, uh, I think what has been, at least for Canadians, would be an overreaction to a problem that isn't an existential threat. Thanks, Paul. Gordon. Can I add just a couple of points? I mean they're not new. Uh, quite frankly, they go back to the 70s. Even initially, this was a struggle between the PRC, the Republic of China, Taiwan, for the hearts and minds of the Canadians of Chinese origin. These have existed and continued um, for decades. What's different about our reaction and that of 
some of our partners, such as the United States, and very recently Australians, who also tended to ignore this for a very long time, is to react publicly. Whether it's intellectual property theft, a different thing I would admit, or interference, as in pressure um, on Canadians, the Canadian tendency has been to occasionally expel someone quietly, um, occasionally to speak to that individual, maybe not. Um, when my view is, bright light is what will deal with this. In other words, our government agencies are not afraid to speak out. There'll be controversy, China will like it, and it won't stop it permanently. It's a bit like crabgrass. Uh, it will continue to grow. You have to pull it up every now and then, but you can't get rid of it by just quiet words behind closed doors. There needs to be publicity about infractions, which also helps to inform the Canadian public. I think that bright light shone on the problems which could have been started a long time ago, needs to be done if you're going to systematically root it out. But again, it will come back. These things need to be done on an ongoing basis. Any comments by uh, Lynette or Ben? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say very briefly, um, my position on, on, on this issue is, my view is you know, quite similar to the panel is, I, I think I'm, I'm aware of you know, what United Front is capable of, of doing and what it does through, you know, uh, hometown associations and various friendship associations. We have seen how it works in China, in Taiwan, and some say Australia and New Zealand, but we also see quite a lot of false positive cases in those countries, particularly Australia and New Zealand. Um, um, so, 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 so I think, you know, yes, there is potential, but I have, I've yet to see any evidence. But that is not to say that we should not boost our immunity and boost our resistance against any potential Chinese infiltration into local community or into you know, Canadian politics. I, I think at this stage, it is about building immunity and, build, and building our resistance rather than overreacting into something that there has not been any, you know, um, a lot of hard, hard evidence for. And we should really guard against false positive. We, we only need one false positive um, case and the reputation of the entire community is gone. Um, and I would caution against that. And, and I, th I think, you know, if, if what happened in Australia and New Zealand uh, kind of guide to how this debate might evolve in the next couple of years in Canada, I think it is actually a guide. In that sense, those countries, what, what happened in those countries are several years ahead of us. Things have become so polarized. Right? Because people talk about things that they don't have a lot of evidence for and you get overreaction and that's in turn feeling and riding on more hawkish sentiment against China. So you get bipolar, increasingly polarized communities and a lot of innocent people call in between. You know, this is, this is, this is how I see it. And I think, you know, I, I think the thing to do is Canada should not walk down that uh, that wrote as far as I'm concerned. Did you want to weigh in on this one as well, Jim? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. I'm delighted that uh, Lynette referred to New Zealand and of course uh, groundbreaking work there by our colleague uh, Anne-Marie Brady, uh, who highlighted uh, the degree of influence operations. Of course, as many of the listeners will be aware, uh, it was almost a decade ago that uh, the director of uh, CSIS, Richard Fadden, uh, warned obliquely about these sorts of operations. As I recall, he did not specifically refer to China, but he was roundly criticized, and I think that reflected in many ways a degree of naivety on the part and wishful thinking on the part of commentators and politicians in Ottawa. Uh, more recently, the CIC members in Vancouver will have, I think, been able to listen directly to Jonathan Manthorpe, who has articulated the nature of, and extent of this problem in his uh, best-selling book, uh, Claws of the Panda, uh, which analyzes Chinese influence operations uh, across the nation. Thanks very much. Um, I have a question here from uh, Bruce Montador. Uh, he says, pretty pessimistic outlooks from everyone. What, if any, are the prospects of a somewhat less uh, pessimistic future if Trump and the Republicans lose? And where is Europe on these issues? Australia and Canada together only add up to a slightly larger middle power. 
Paul, again, you're nodding. So do you want to start off with that one? Um, interesting, uh, interesting question. And I think, is there a person in Ottawa or any major capital that isn't asking that question about where the United States is likely to go in the event of a Biden victory, which was the frame of the question. And um, I, <laughs> I think we're, we're not going to be at the end of US-China strategic competition. But what there may be is a somewhat more nuanced take on what confrontation with China will look like. Um, I'm concerned that techno-nationalism that has been fostered in the Trump period is going to be the way of the future. As Jim Boutelier and others uh, uh, have, have claimed, there is going to be technological decoupling between those countries. And I don't think that is going to be reversed by a Biden administration. Now, what may happen is a much more sophisticated domestic policy for increasing Chinese innovation, uh, excuse me, American innovation, uh, for building self-strengthening America in technological competition with China. I think we're going to see a Biden administration that will be looking to create those alliances, coalition of willing in a new way with respect for the partners in those coalitions rather than an attack on them at the same time they are attacking China. So I think uh, at this moment in American history where fear of China is so deep, bicameral, bipartisan, at multiple levels of US society, the, the ship of um, competition and even elements of confrontation isn't gonna be going in a different direction. Um, it'll be navigated a wee bit differently. But this is a long-term strategic rivalry. And that is the number one strategic question for Ottawa, whether we want to participate in that strategic competition and confrontation that will not be a lot less under a Biden administration, or are we looking for something that is somewhat more independent? And there, I think we can learn from our Australian friends who as down as they are in China, some of their characterizations are as grim as what Jim presented a few minutes ago. Our Australian friends are saying, just a second, lining up with the Americans on all elements of the confrontation with China is wrong. Uh, we uh, have to show we are not lining up with that full competition game. They will strengthen their own military resources uh, they're increasing spending in ways that Jim knows very well. But they are not saying we're lining up for an American Cold War with China. And I'm, I'm afraid that under a Biden administration, it may not be quite a Cold War, but it's going to be only half a step from that. Uh, and uh, liberal America, engagement America, has a long way to come back in looking for more balance in the relationship. Thanks, Paul. Gordon. Yeah, can I just pitch in on Europe? Uh, Paul covered the United States, I think, quite effectively, references to Australia. Um, again, I don't think the ground is yet ripe for a broad coalition um, against China. Um, Germany has had every opportunity to take a similar stance on Huawei as the United States. Um, Germany is deeply dependent on its auto industry, a key export earner. It, Germany, like Canada, is deeply dependent on international trade for its prosperity. And Europe, the EU, is all over the map. And that's one reason I think we haven't seen a coherent European strategy emerge. Um, within that group are some of the smaller Eastern European countries that actually have first-rate relationship with Beijing. Um, and, uh, and Italy being virtually in that same camp. UK is now a special case, not only being uh, not in EU per se, but being rather more skeptical. And I, I have a sense that China has its own cards to play. Again, my warning at the beginning, China has ways in which it can push back. It is active in courting Europe, not with the kind of success it was looking for, but I don't see Europeans prepared to join in a US-led crusade against China at this point. And in fact, with Trump in particular, he's been so destructive of European cross-Atlantic ties, be it NATO or, or in political terms, uh, Europe, and whether it's Merkel and Germany, aren't prepared to march behind 
a U.S. lead as yet. Now, different circumstances, um, clear Chinese aggression, perhaps, maybe definitely. But in the, in the midterm, you're going to see a whole range of our Western partners all over the map, uh, we being one of them, without a clear trend uh, evident as yet. Jim, did you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I have the good fortune of going out to Europe uh, every six months or so to have negotiations or discussions with uh, NATO colleagues. And uh, I must say that the past two years have, uh, from my perspective, uh, been quite remarkable. Uh, there's been a profound turnaround uh, in European attitudes towards uh, China. Uh, two years ago, I would suggest that most of my uh, interlocutors viewed China with a sort of academic interest. But now in my recent visits to Europe, what I found mm -hmm. is that there's a profound anxiety about uh, China. And uh, what we've seen, of course, is the degree to which China has focused on Europe. Uh, Wang Yi uh, in his swing across Europe recently. Xi, as I understand, is scheduled to visit Europe. Uh, time after time, it's the siren song, all is well, stay with us. And yet, um, what I would suggest is that uh, increasingly, despite disarray within EU, EU with Brexit and with the United States, uh, that there is a mounting pushback against uh, China. Along the southern tier, that is to say, um, Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, the weaker economies, uh, it comes no surprise, I think, that Italy has signed on into the Belgian road uh, by virtue of its powerless financial condition. Uh, and, of course, uh, the Chinese have made major inroads in Greece. But elsewhere, um, a, a quite distinct uh, anti-Chinese sentiment. Thank you. Lynette, any thoughts? Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I agree that, you know, um, European countries' attitudes and policies towards China, is, they are really a heterogeneous society, which is difficult to bring, to bring them together and unite them um, on some one or two single interests. But um, I think one country that people have not mentioned that has um, actually changed its attitude and policy towards China in the recent past is the UK, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. After Hong Kong, and after the pandemic, we see UK coming out and say that, you know, we are going to ban Huawei. Whereas previously they were, they were bordering in between friendly towards Huawei and going for, you know, core versus periphery type of differentiation towards uh, embracing the Chinese company. And, 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 and I think that's, that is interesting on, on several dimensions because I think I suspect that what played out domestically is not that different from what is playing out, what has been playing out in Canada in the last couple of years as well. That they recalculate the costs and benefits and recalibrate the, the sort of power that China is becoming and hence how they should, they should play it. Um, you know, I, on, the United, on, on, on Biden versus Trump, I, I think another Trump win would be, would be win for China. Um, and um, if, Bi if Biden gets elected, um, we will see some changes towards his China policy, but I think fundamentally, uh, we're not going to return to where we were several years ago um, because you know, the world is now in a, in a different place, especially uh, post-pandemic. Post Thanks very much. Um, we have a question from Aaron Williams. Uh, you've all played an important role in educating different groups of Canadians about China. Do you find yourselves having to rethink how you do that in light of changes in the relationship and changes in Canadian perceptions? And I just want to add to that uh, one of my own questions with regard to you know, China competency. And um, uh, you know, what advice would you provide to young Canadians with regard to um, how they can um, learn about China and how they could go about uh, educating themselves about China. So, Paul, do you want to kick that one off? Sure, happy to do that. And I, I think uh, Aaron's question is aimed at people who are all, in one way or another, in the education business uh, and the, the look. I, I draw attention to, to all of us to a recent report by the British Foreign Policy Group, which is a group of academics in the United Kingdom that have written a piece 
on where the UK should position itself in the kind of strategic uh, context that we've talked about. And some of the most interesting sections are on what they advocate by way of what the United Kingdom should do in educating uh, a, a, um, uh, a broader swath of particularly civil servants, uh, people who go into the civil service. And they come up with a variety of suggestions that are, are pretty thoughtful, but, but not fundamentally different than what we've been arguing about Asian competencies, whether they're other countries or in our, in our context, the China discussion, what we need. I mean, first thing is that the two people who are on the panel with us, Susan Gregson and Gordon Holden, uh, are anomalies. They are not, we don't have many Susan Gregsons and many Gordon Holdens in our system with Chinese language, with experience, with capabilities. And how we're going to do that, not to just produce specialists, but people with a China familiarity, we have to mobilize our universities in new ways. We need more, uh, uh, we need more training programs. Both of the people uh, on, uh, on this broadcast are exactly people who are doing that. We need that times 10. I don't think we would have got into the Meng Wanzhou issue if we had had more people in key decision spots in Ottawa who had minimal Asian knowledge, much less Asia competence. And that's not to denigrate their other skills, but we are still far behind. And I found it fascinating as the UK is trying to say, what can they do to mobilize? Well, they think their universities, their soft power, their educational systems can be brought in, need to be readjusted to have a much deeper connection with Whitehall and other and other. And I think there, while we've talked about this, Susan, for a decade, David Mulroney, others have pushed this very hard, you in particular. We've <laughs> haven't had the resources or the fear that would drive something. If the Meng Wanzhou case doesn't show us the error of our ways, we're in trouble. Uh, but it's, it's going to need a bigger mobilization effort. Resources, private sector, but I think the real need is inside government uh, in different ways. So. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And we expect the Asia Pacific Foundation to take the lead in this noble cause uh, in, uh, uh, to, to redouble its efforts. Gordon, you've been uh, leading the China Institute for a number of years now. And uh, so what, what would your perspective be on this issue? Fair enough. Well, as I often do, I echo some of Paul's points, but I won't repeat them. But um, one of my concerns is not just the lack of people who are in effect China experts are rather too few of them. And these ought to be, and quite frankly, a, a five or tenfold increase would not be uh, uncalled for. But there's also a rich, a great need now for people who have, let's say a sectoral skill. Like this is the hot spot right now. If you have um, a deep knowledge of finance, but you also know something about the Chinese financial system, even if you don't have a complete line and you've worked there, you've worked on that file. If you know something about the auto industry, um, and you know something about the Chinese auto industry and an engineer, that's a, a, a very employable skill set. Some of the most employable people are now who know something about China, but also about a particular thing. And I hate to come back to Germany again, but I think Germany is doing a better job. Now, I know people are skeptical about Germany and China, but they're each other's biggest trading partners. And Merkel talked to Xi Jinping today and said, look, there's a political will to make a trade agreement. But behind that is a, a much more systematic, Germanic, I would argue, approach to things Chinese. Um, German universities taking China very seriously, producing a number of experts. We're so, um, in my view, profoundly influenced by the United States and by our own failures. We, we need to look at some of the success stories and Germany is one of those. Um, not just people who are, as we line up now in Canada, anti-China, pro-China, just China knowledge. Yes. Work at that for five or 10 years, then make up your mind. Um, but let's not start off from entirely one dimension or the other. Just learn about China, soak it in, then come to your conclusions. Thanks, Gordon. Jim, did you want to weigh in on this one? 
Well, yes, thank you, Susan. And uh, among other things, uh, Gordon should be complimented because uh, over the years, his institute has been at the forefront of providing uh, detailed top-level uh, briefings for uh, uh, GAC uh, personnel on, uh, on China. I've lamented uh, Canadian naivety by way of a sweep and critique, but I'm going to be naive in the sense that uh, I've always argued that what we need is a three or four week course uh, in international affairs for new MPs, because uh, I think back mm. to the time when in the afterglow of Jack Layton, uh, there were something like 25 young uh, MPs uh, uh, elected on behalf of the NDP. Uh, they were, for the most part, in their mid-20s, and uh, the responsibilities they had as members of parliament, uh, they should have been um, required, I think, to have had detailed briefings on, on, on many of these issues. I think that's particularly important. Um, I think Paul referred to resources. I, my, my own feeling is it's political will. Uh, we really have to have more political will in terms of there's a, a sort of profound parochialism in Canada, small town uh, view of the world. Uh, we see ourselves as major players, but uh, we do need, I think, further what Gordon was saying, to be far more uh, conscientious in terms of educating ourselves about the world in which we work. Parenthetically, uh, I think uh, uh, out of every 10 automobiles uh, in Germany, three are sold in China. So that's uh, some pretty significant leverage when it comes to G Merkel discussions, I'm sure. Thank you. Great, thanks. Lynette, did you have any comments on this one? Yeah, so I'll, I, I agree with, with, with Jim and others that I recognize the significance of continuing to invest in Asia and China competence. But, but as an educator myself, I, I think I, I, I need to be, if I could be honest, I think it's, it's getting increasingly difficult. So 10 years ago, I could tell my students, you need to study Chinese, you need to go to China because it's of commercial significance and it's of geopolitical significance too. Now, I, I, have, no, I have no good reason to, con to convince them. It is declining in terms of commercial significance. There was an article just two weeks ago in the New York Times of The Economist that talked about the value of learning Python versus learning Chinese that you can actually make more money by learning Python, then why should people go learn Chinese, right? And it's increasingly difficult to get to do work in China. I have got PhD students wanting to do research, do, re, uh, do a PhD in, in, in Chinese politics. I, I don't know where to send them to, what topics to choose, you know, contentious politics, repression. Uh, they might be inviting risk and trouble to themselves. Um, they used to be able to just uh, hide out in Hong Kong and study China from Hong Kong. And now Hong Kong is not safe and is, is in some sense even worse than mainland China. So where, mm -hmm. so where do they go? Maybe Taiwan, maybe Australia, maybe, maybe Singapore and maybe border of Thailand and Yunnan. You know, I think, I think you know, we, we need to be creat creative about, about, about how we do things. But you know, there's no doubt in my mind that it's getting increasingly difficult to convince students to go to China to invest in China. Thank you for that. Uh, um, we've got a question on um, the, uh, oh, this is a question from Paul Meyer. Could you update as to the current state of the Canada PRC official consultative processes? Is everything suspended or are there still active dialogue uh, channels? So that is a question for me, but unfortunately, I really can't uh, I, I can't uh, provide any uh, shed any light on that particular issue. Does anyone else have uh, a comment on that? Gordon, yeah, my impression is things are basically mm -hmm. shut down. I know that when you've had a, uh, brief meetings in third countries between Prime Minister and the Chinese Premier, that sort of counted as part of the strategic dialogue foreign ministers have met on the margins. I suppose that then checks the box there, but this is more band-aid or first aid to the relationship as opposed to what it was designed to be, which was main landing, main landing uh, regular consultation where you got into the machine and you looked at what could be done and planning. Uh, so I'd argue some of the boxes may be ticked, um, but they're not ticked in the way that was meant to be. And many of them aren't happening at all. 
And for our audience, you know, the, um, the joint list of outcomes from the 2016 exchange of visits uh, provided a whole architecture for um, bilateral engagement on a whole uh, raft of various files. And um, while you can argue that having, um, you know, having agreeing to, to meet is not, um, does not provide you with any progress on anything, I would counter argue that if you've got an agreement to meet at a senior level, then the work has to be done below that to, to, uh, to raise things up. So um, I, th I think that's, where, that's what we're talking about with regard to this question. But Paul, you wanted in on this. Yeah, I do. And um, where we've been, we began with the quagmire of the, um, the standoff around uh, the two Michaels and uh, Adam mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> And it's clear that plus COVID have made most of the G to G, government to government meetings, either difficult or extremely awkward. Uh, and then add in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, as we found with our foreign minister's discussion with Wang Yi, uh, which uh, was, was not exactly a, a love-in. It was a, probably a useful exchange, but not a love-in. And I'd, I'd put to, to all of us the consideration that our Chinese friends have been speaking to us about recently is what can we do in this context to maintain the discussion on those areas where we need cooperation. Some of those are outlined climate change. And even some areas where we have difficulties like data security questions uh, in response to something like the Wang Yi Initiative. And that's the use of track two and track 1.5 mechanisms. And we have a, a pretty good history of this though on a much smaller scale than our American friends. But there have been a variety of areas over the years where we have had very good conversations that at least keep a dialogue going, that on occasion have led to some common action. For example, China coming into the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, there have been a variety of areas where at the request of our Chinese counterparts who also see us in a, in a dark decade, um, that we're going to be, have to be inventive in the mechanisms we're going to use to maintain some of that, I think at least for the next year and maybe beyond it. But Gordon has run a very successful enterprise, uh, Susan Gregson. There, we've got eight or nine different units in Canada working with our government, trying to find ways of constructive discussions with China when at the official level we're uh, constipated. Jim, any, any thoughts to add to this uh, discussion? Uh, no, I don't think so, uh, Susan. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Lynette? No? Okay. Um, so maybe I could just um, uh, ask a, a kind of a related question, and, and maybe I'll, I'll direct this first to you, Gordon. Um, I, I think you'll agree with the assertion that diplomacy is a really long game where results can take decades uh, to come to fruition. And knowing this, uh, we still have to deal with a political cycle and a new cycle that's really constricted and, uh, and, and also in the information age when immediacy of response and immediacy of, of uh, reaction is expected and demanded. So um, how do you balance that dichotomy? How do, you, how do you try to keep your head up and look at the long game and, and, and ensure that we're looking out for Canada's interests over the long term. Um, and, and we all know that the Chinese are doing this, right? They play the long game. They have, they have long-term plans and they stick to them. Um, and that's something that, that we can't, uh, that, we, that we've had difficulty um, grappling with in, in Canada and in fact, in most Western democracies. So Gordon, do you have any, any thoughts on- Such, on, a, tough, uh, such a tough question. Both you and I have been in those trenches, Susan, and you know how hard it is to, to move things along, but there, there have been successes. One of the challenges is much of the work has to be done privately behind closed doors and Canadian public and the media really don't like that. I get that. I mean, you, the idea that you're, you're sending delegations, you're sending individuals, perhaps under the radar even to talk to the Chinese side, that makes Canadians nervous. Secret agreements secretly arrived at 
uh, is one, one way of decrying that. Um, they want, they, the public and the media want us to want instant results, as you say. That's not going to happen in our hothouse environment. And there's a new element, um, which Paul studied in detail. Now, there were exceptions, I suppose, like Tiananmen, but in general, this relationship for a long time was a boutique relationship. A handful of people and then external affairs. When law affairs kind of managed this with embassies, it came in the, the press occasionally, but there wasn't much attention. There'd be a high level visit and now and then. But, um, but now it's a domestic issue and a central plank of the new conservative leaders' um, policies are China policy. In fact, it's the leading part of foreign policy uh, prescriptions of the, uh, the new leader of the conservative party. And that drives us in a direction, and, and the China committee, which Paul alluded to, that's a good thing. I like the idea that our parliamentarians debate these things, but it often tends to be more heat than light, and it doesn't necessarily yield practical things. That hard slog behind the scenes is really what's more likely to achieve forward progress. Chinese are very good at it. Um, I've had my bruises and scars from direct across the table negotiation, as you have. Um, I felt times I got up from the table, I had to check if my wallet was still. They're really good at it. <laughs> They're really good at it. But so can we. Canadians are not woman for woman, man for man inferior. Um, it just needs to be practiced. It needs to be done frequently. Um, and uh, we need to have the political support of, our, of our, those doing it, need the support of the political masters and some tolerance of the public and media to get on with it quietly and hope to see the results. Thanks, Gordon. Paul, did you have any... Uh... Uh, Lynette, did you want in on that one? Yeah, um, I've just lost. I've just lost my train of thought. You could go back. You could go to other other panels. Okay. <laughs> okay, Jim. Any? Well, I, I'm just wondering, Susan, uh, without risk of uh, being unnecessarily provocative, but I'm beginning to wonder whether there's a missing gene in the Canadian character, and I don't want to be too hard on poor Canada, but. When I look over the years, there seems to be a deep sort of intellectual aversion to trying to articulate foreign policy positions. And I realize what Gordon is saying, that so much of the work is in the trenches and behind the scenes and, and has to be by the very nature. But there's been a paucity of really muscular foreign policy papers or white papers over the years. And... Uh, for example, uh, half a dozen years ago, when the latest defense white paper emerged, uh, it was without the, uh, it had no foreign policy context whatsoever, other than uh, the foreign minister stood up and delivered a speech, as you recall, uh, in uh, the House of Commons uh, 24 hours before the defense paper emerged. So uh, it seems as a nation, we're, we're not very good uh, at really coming to grips with uh, muscular uh, foreign policy statements. Perhaps the argument is that the world is too dynamic uh, for that, but uh, I look back and see uh, a, a remarkable poverty in terms of real thoughtful foreign policy statements, uh, white papers coming out of Ottawa. Well, that's a very interesting comment, um, Jim. Uh, and I think you'll be aware that uh, Australia came out with a, was it an Asia white paper or China? I think it was an Asia yeah. white paper. Yes. A number of that. years ago. Was it about 10 years ago? And that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, did create a lot of public discussion and engagement. And in order to come up with a, with a, um, you, you know, with, with such a document for, for a country like Australia. Um, so interesting. Lynette, did you... Um, yeah, my, my, my thoughts are slowly coming back to me. Uh, <laughs> two observations. One is, I, you know, I agree that I, I, I think, you know, China issues has now become mainstream and I suspect becoming more of an, elect, more of an electoral issue than, than it has ever, ever before in Canada. And I think that's a good thing. That's the place that I think China deserves in Canadian politics. And, the, and number two is, we often see these two sets of bilateral relationship, Canada, uh, US-Canada relations and Canada-China relations as two sets of, of, of separate bilateral relationship. I think they are actually trilateral relationship. I think Mohan Zhou issue illustrates that whatever mm -hmm. we do with the United States, China will be carefully watching us. There will be trade-off involved. Uh, it will react in certain ways. We have to anticipate how we have to counter-react. We want to, to strike a free trade deal with China. The United States is watching us. It is going to react in certain ways and put pressure on, on, on us. So it, it has become 
the calculation of benefits and, and, and costs and considerations, I think has become so much more complicated because they are in rivalry with each other and we are caught in between. So it has become a trilateral relationship. Yeah, good, good point, good point. Okay, let's move on to um, another uh, question. We have a question from uh, Charles Dumbrill. Could the panelists please comment on the Shandong Gold Mining Acquisition of TMAC Resources Mine in the Arctic? What do Canadians need to know about the deal, currently under review by the federal government? Do you think the deal would go through? Would a Canadian company be able to buy a similar Chinese company with reciprocal treatment? And since we're talking about the Arctic, maybe we could also, you know, in the context of um, uh, China's uh, assertion that it is a near Arctic power, um, which I think geographically doesn't really exist. They kind of made that up, but, but um, if we could sort of maybe address that as well. So Gordon, you, I think you wanted to. Oh, thank you very much. I'll just try and deal with Shandong and the question of investment and leave to others some of these broader, broader questions. And um, all Chinese investment is now controversial in Canada. And Shandong, uh, the idea that there's gonna be a gold mine that uh, I heard the a former CSIS director the other day call, trying to call gold a strategic commodity. Well, gold's found pretty broadly in the world. And as soon as the price goes up, a lot of mines spring into action in Canada, Australia, the US and elsewhere. The question on, could a Canadian company do the same thing? No. In fact, there were many exploration companies in, in uh, Canadian exploration com countries, I see you nodding, so you remember this, yeah. who were asked by provinces to try and find gold. And the rule ended up being, in my mind, if you find it, we will keep it. In other words, once it was discovered, <laughs> they pushed out of it's that. It's ours, yeah. And so there's not good. On the other hand, reciprocity is a tricky thing. We can apply that more broadly um, in a lot of countries um, where it's not going to work. In other words, if we say that if we can't do this in, in China, we can't, they shouldn't be allowed to do it here. That's one argument, I suppose. That should be taken into account. Uh, but um, there weren't a lot of other bidders. Uh, a, country going, a company going bankrupt. And one thing I've noticed is interesting is that when you ask Canadians about investment in the Arctic, they have an almost sacred idea, fair enough, the unspoiled north, um, we don't want foreigners dealing there, particularly Chinese, stay out Chinese. When you ask northerners, they can get more nuanced responses, particularly from indigenous peoples who say, well, actually we do need investment, we need jobs. Hold on a minute. We Northerners ought to have a rule of a rule. I'm not saying that the Northerners or indigenous communities in the North are saying, bring on Chinese investors, but in some cases they are. And they tend to be much more open to the idea than, than we are. People will say, well, Shandong is going, there's a jetty there right now. And this is pretty modest stuff. They want to build a dock. And this will be just a few hundred kilometers from the Northwest Passage before you know they're going to be Chinese submarines dock. I'm a bit skeptical about the strategic argument. Um, where I am nervous, actually, when it comes to Chinese investment is not as much in the resource sector, it's in those high tech things that go down, disappear down electron tubes or be carried away on a thumb drive in a briefcase. That's where I'm nervous. We remain a sovereign country. Parliament can put a stop to any exports of any sort at the time of their choosing. So I'd say, my guess is that Shandong will be turned down. There's already US opposition to it, um, particularly given it's in the North. I think the odds right now of making them fly uh, are small, but no one else so far has put forward a serious bid. So the North, if you want to, if you want investment and you rule out China, there goes your largest potential source. Thanks, Gordon. Anybody else want in on that one? Uh, Susan, uh, Jim Boutillier here. Yeah. Uh, I think that Gordon struck upon a particularly important word uh, and that's reciprocity. And I think that's been one of the keys to the challenges of dealing with China. And we can certainly see this in the current Sino-American narrative, uh, the failure uh, of the players to provide reciprocity, whether it's in the realm of journalism or whether it's in the realm of business operations and so on. So that may be one of the things that we have to keep an eye on as we move forward in our own relationship between Canada and China, how to maintain uh, fairly high levels of reciprocity. Um, Michael Clare in his book, uh, Race for What's Left, says that as minerals become more and more difficult to find, uh, that several things are happening. We're going farther and farther offshore. 
Uh, we're going farther and farther north, that is to say into the Arctic, and we're going into some pretty exotic uh, spots in terms of mineral uh, exploration and exploitation. But it's the Arctic. And I, I think of your comment about the Chinese, uh, and I think back to uh, the comment about the Soviet Union and the Cold War that uh, the Russians uh, rattled all the doors and knocked on all the windows until they found one open and then they invited themselves in. And that's uh, the near Arctic uh, argument, I think, as far as Beijing is concerned. But uh, as the Arctic begins to open, and I appreciate uh, what uh, Gordon has just said, um, it does provide the Chinese with a new arena in terms of maritime and, in this case, submarine operations over and against uh, the United States. And so I think this is a source of mounting anxiety uh, for the Americans that uh, with uh, the disappearance of ICE, although ICE would facilitate in some ways submarine operations, uh, that we're now looking at a new ocean in terms of maritime uh, tensions, at least uh, going forward. Thanks, Jim. Any other comments from, from panelists, Lynette, Paul, no? Okay. So we have an, another question here on um, uh, that, that relates to India. So from Aman Saini, should uh, Canada's China policy from now on weigh the role of its India policy as a balance and therefore think it's, uh, seek its potential in becoming an active participant of Indo-Pacific partnership? Any thoughts on that? Paul? Yeah. Um, well, the uh, Indo-Pacific concept is being pretty hotly debated uh, in Ottawa and in our town here in Vancouver, based on conference and work by the Asia Pacific Foundation. And uh, I think that there's um, a fair amount of momentum around that, but without complete agreement and certainly, uh, certainly not unanimity on what the Indo-Pacific concept is really about. If Indo-Pacific is a way of saying there's new interactions uh, on the Asian side of the Pacific uh, in the maritime domain that deserve our uh, attention, that we're going to be brought into, the answer is obviously yes. If on the other hand, Indo-Pacific is in some of its formulations defined as a way of building a coalition to counterbalance uh, or to contain, depending on who advocates it, China, uh, that's a concept that uh, a number of Asians are not supportive of, including ASEAN, uh, which has its own uh, Indo-Pacific concept, but not as a way a containment device. Uh, and that um, the where Canadians position on this is going to be important as a signal for where we stand in a U.S.-China confrontation. Now, to bring India in, um, I don't think a country like Canada has much to contribute or to benefit from trying to facilitate some kind of strategic interaction between the Americans and the, uh, and the Indians uh, in this context. Um, we, uh, <laughs> the underdeveloped nature of our diplomatic, our security, interactions with, with India is, is substantial. Uh, we are, if we were talking, if this whole session had been set up around Canada-India relations, where we have a whole number of problems, even at the same time that we have some commonalities, it's a pretty thin read. Canada-India is not a huge domestic issue. It is for specific groups. And I think we better be uh, it would be wise to be careful about trying to push our way into an enterprise where we don't have much to offer and where we're probably not really wanted. Other thoughts from panelists on this one? I think, Susan, that uh, the emergence of India in the larger geostrategic landscape uh, is an extremely important phenomenon. Uh, I think that doing business in India, broadly speaking, and I'm not referring just to commerce, but doing business in India is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. But the trend lines are beginning to move, I think, increasingly into the Indian Ocean. 
uh, region uh, writ large. And uh, I think that it may very well be, uh, although uh, our diplomatic resources are at full stretch, that we should be, in fact, paying a good deal more important, a good deal more attention, forgive me, uh, to what's happening uh, in New Delhi than we have hitherto. And certainly the, the recent um, uh, border uh, flare-up between India and China is something to, to keep in mind in this, uh, in this regard as well. Um, we're five minutes away from our closing time, and I think I need to turn the floor back to the CIC, who have some announcements to make. But before I do, I want to um, thank our panelists very much for your really insightful presentations and uh, this evening to the participants for some excellent questions that you've put forward. Um, and I think we've had um, a, a very rich discussion this evening. I think uh, this is we've we've been challenged by our by our audience, and uh, we've uh, explored some uh, some areas with regard to the Canada-China relationship that uh, we we need to talk about in in a very serious way uh, much more often in for forums like this. So thank you very much to the to the uh, Canadian International Council for organizing this evening and for uh, making this possible. So now I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Ben. Thank you, Susan. Um, I, I'd just like to say that I'm uh, pleasantly surprised by the amount of ground that we managed to cover in uh, two hours um, on, on such a uh, broad and uh, multifaceted topic. Um, on behalf of uh, CIC Vancouver, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to um, all of our panelists and uh, to our moderator for holding uh, such an informative and interesting discussion uh, this evening. Before concluding our event, I'd also like to provide a couple of updates from our branch. On Monday, October 5th, uh, CIC Vancouver will be hosting Eve T. Bergen, a uh, distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation uh, of Canada and co-director of the UBC Center for Japanese Research for a uh, discussion event. Uh, we plan on posting the event this week, and we encourage you to register for what promises to be another very interesting discussion. We are also planning to hold our annual general assembly on Friday, October 16th at 5 p.m. So this is our uh, an annual event and it will be open to the public. It'll be an opportunity for our members to hear administrative updates from our branch leadership and to voice how they would like to see us move forward as a branch um, in the future for the coming year uh, and during this uh, highly unusual time. That just about concludes our event. Um, thank you very much once again to our panelists and moderator and uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a pleasant week. Thank you, CSE, and thank you, Susan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm.